please realize that G is just the square root of something. Now I'm using U again, but it's totally separate from the U I'm using up there. The U is actually everything underneath that square root, okay, which is 5x plus root 5x. So the question is, can we take derivative of these? And the answer is yes, we can. We can use our little chain rule here. We have, um, we already know the derivative of the square root of u is 1 half dg du is 1 half u to the negative 1 half. And then um, we take the derivative here of u with respect to x. Now here we're not going to run into a chain rule problem because the derivative of 5x we already know is 5 plus now this is the same as this right here is the same as square root of 5 times x to the 1 half and I can just treat the square root of 5 as a constant and then use the power rule bring the 1 half out so this should turn this should turn into whoa what's going on okay this one right here, when I take its derivative, should be square root of 5 times 1 half x to the negative 1 half. And so to finally over here get the derivative of what g is, so to get this derivative, which we need to stick right in here, okay, we need to actually complete the chain rule here, so we have to multiply this times this. All right, so I, I'm r really running out of room. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll put it down here and then erase it in a second. So the derivative of g will be the 1 half u to the negative 1 half times, now everything over here, 5 plus uh, root 5 over 2 root x. So all I did there was um, put the root 5 um, over 2 right here, put that right there, and then um, x is negative 1 half, I just drop it to the bottom and turn it back into a root. So that <clears throat> that is our derivative, but now I need to replace this u right here with what u is, and be careful, the u I'm using is this u, not the black one up here, all right, because that's totally separate. I'm coming back to that. So I have 1 half, in fact, I think what I'll do is I'll say 1 over and that thing keeps popping up, and I'm not happy about it. Uh, 1 over 2, u to the negative 1 half comes down, and then it's a square root. Now, what was u? u was actually 5 plus, 5x five plus root 5x. And then we have times the rest of it, 5 plus root 5 over 2 root x. Now, all of that was just the derivative of g. <coughs> And so that piece right here, right, that was the derivative of this, which is what we want to plug in right there. So let me try and put that in there. I'll get that, all that out of there. And I'll do this in black. So we have plus up here, um, 1 over... 2 root 5x plus root 5x times 5 plus root 5 over 2 root x, right there. And now we're ready to finish this problem up. I know this is a lot of work, but um, <clears throat> let me just let you have one last view of everything, and I'm going to erase some stuff. Get rid of all this. So I actually have a chain rule inside of a chain rule in this problem. That's what's happening here. Okay, so now what I have to do is I have to take this and multiply it times this. So the derivative of y will be equal to 1 over... 2 root y, that's just rewriting this, dropping the u down, times 
everything I have here, uh, everything, all of that. Now, I believe I have an easy way of rewriting that. That's cheating, isn't it? Whoa. There we go. All right, so there it is. And then all I need to do now is replace this U with what U is. And remember, U is actually this stuff. So if you do that, you'll get your, your final result. And it is really ugly. And uh, I'm going to look to see how they simplify, if they simplify it. Yeah, as suspected, they leave out quite a bit, <laughs> as you can see. So I'll get to how they did that in just a second. Remember, I told you there's two ways to go about this, systematically with the tables or just thinking through it. I'm, I'm going to come back. I think what I'll do is I'll redo these problems without doing the table, just so you can see the difference. Okay, find all the points on the graph of the function 2 sine x plus sine squared x at which the tangent line is horizontal. Use n as an arbitrary in integer. So when we say we want the tangent line to be horizontal, that means we want to know when the derivative of this function is 0. Right? Slope is 0. So what I need to do is I need to take the derivative of the function. So look at this function. It's got something here plus something here. So what I can do is take derivative of each of these individually. So this should be pretty clean to start. The derivative of f with respect to x is, well, first of all, the 2 in front of the sine is a constant. The derivative of sine there is cosine. Plus, now on the next piece, I'm going to need to do some separate work. I'm just going to, for the sake of, of making this easy, I'm going to call this g. Okay, g is equal to sine squared x. So notice that we have an outer function, something's being squared, and then the thing that's being squared is sine. So this is a composition, so I'm going to have to um, use chain rule. So g is something squared, and the thing that's being squared is sine x. I make my table. The derivative of g with respect to u is, u, uh, sorry, to u. to u, and the derivative of u with respect to x is cosine x. So g prime is equal to 2u, so multiply those two together times cosine x, but what is x? What is u? u is sine x, so this is 2 sine x cosine x. So write this u is that. So now I'm going to come back up here and plug this in. The derivative of this g goes right there. And we just said it was 2 sine x cosine x. So there's my derivative. Going to have to delete some stuff here. Okay, so now what I need to do is figure out when that's 0. So I will take this now, okay, and I will set it to 0. So 2 cosine x plus 2 sine x cosine x is 0. And this is a trig equation, so I'm going to factor it. I'm going to pull a 2 cosine x out of both terms and be left with 1 plus sine x. And now since I have multiplication, I can just set each one of these equal to 0. In fact, I can divide everything by 2 to get rid of that. So I want to know when the two factors cosine of x, when is that equal to 0? I want to know when 1 plus sine x, the other factor, is equal to 0. In other words, when is sine x equal to negative 1. So this is going to be require some review of pre-cal. Um, if we look at our unit circle, I think I can draw a circle in here. Oh, that's not what I want. Oh, no, that didn't work out at all. The thing was a little bit too big, wouldn't you say? I could have drawn a circle by now, huh? 
Yeah, let me just draw a circle. Okay, so if we look at our unit circle, we remember that on the unit circle, if you have some angle theta, the unit circle, this is 1, that corresponds to some point, x and y. The x-coordinate will always be cosine theta. The y-coordinate will always be sine theta. So when we come up here and we ask ourselves, when is cosine of an angle, now don't confuse this x with this x, this may as well be theta, but we're saying when is the cosine function zero? So you want to go around this circle and you want to ask yourself, when is the x-coordinate on the unit circle zero? Well, the only places that that happens, that you get an x-coordinate of zero, is here and here. So this angle from here to here is, is pi over 2. And then the angle that goes all the way from here to here is 3 pi over 2. And remember, we could also go around again, all the way around and back like that. So we, we could go pi over 2 and then add another full rotation. Or we could add go to pi over 2 and add two rotations, right? Or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6. We could also go backwards. But notice that these two, two points are directly across from each other. So if I, if I come in here and I think about it this way, I can go, all right, start out, go pi over 2, and then from there, just add half a rotation, and I'm here. And then add another half, and I'm here again. Then add another half, and I'm here, and add another half. Half a rotation. So <clears throat> my general solution is that my x needs to be pi over 2. But I can also add any half rotation. Now, full rotation is pi. Half a rotation is, I mean, sorry, full rotation is 2 pi. Half a rotation is pi. And I can add as many of those as I want. So I say pi n. So any multiple of pi is added to the pi over 2. That's my general solution here. Now, when I am looking at the other equation, I'm saying, hey, when is the sine negative 1? I want to come over here and I want to ask myself, okay, where is my y-coordinate negative 1? Well, the only place that the y-coordinate is negative 1 is here. And that point already get, appears in this list because it's part of the, the solutions for the other equation. So the, the only possibilities are when x is equal to pi over 2 plus pi n. Any multiple um, of pi added to pi over 2 should give me all my solutions. Now, um, let's see here. Looks like they want, yeah, that's really frustrating. That's probably confusing to you now that I've explained it this way. Um, looks like they want to find all the points. Hold on. Find all the points on the graph. Okay. Well, now what we need to do, okay, these are where our, our general solutions are. We need to actually plug these in into this and see what comes out. So we already know that if we plug in, let's see if we plug in pi over 2. What would happen if we plug pi over 2 into that top function? Sorry, I didn't read it completely. They want the, basically, they want the, y, the, the function's value at these critical points also. So um, plug pi over 2 in here. We get sine 2. I mean, I'm sorry, 2 sine of pi over 2 plus, notice I'm not plugging into the derivative, I'm plugging it into the function. Okay, so sine of pi over 2 is, is 1, so this is just going to be 2 plus, now si, sine of pi over 2 is 1, then square it, I just get 1, so this is 3. So I'm going to get 3 out when I plug pi over 2 in. Now what would happen if I plug in um, the other point, which was 3 pi over 2, or any any multiple of it? 2 pi multiple. Um, so 2 sine of 3 pi over 2 plus sine squared 3 pi over 2. Okay, when I, when I take sine of 3 pi over 2, I get negative 1. So I get this. And then plus sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, but then I square it, so I get 1. If I put those together, I get negative 1. 
So what they're trying to get you to see here is that you do get negative 1 sometimes. That's a smaller value. And then larger value would be you get 3. But you need the x coordinates that do that. So even though my general solution was correct here, um, right here, I need to kind of rethink this a little bit just so I can get my answers up there. I'll draw a quick unit circle again. We know that when we're up here, that's like being at pi over 2. And any time I'm up there, I'm going to get 3 to come out. So how do I say pi over 2 and any, any multiple, 2 pi multiple of it? So we go pi over 2, and then we come all the way back around one rotation. Full rotation is 2 pi. Or I could go around again. I would, that would be adding 4 pi. So to get 3 to come out, I need to start at pi over 2. I need to add 2 pi n to that. Now, to get negative 1 to come out, I need to be down here at this point, And that's 3 pi over 2. But then I can add a full rotation to that and be back at the same place. So 3 pi over 2 plus 2 pi n will give you negative 1. All right, let's take a look at this uh, solution. 